by Black History Walks. We organize walks, talks, and films on African history of London each month, all year long, for the last 13 years. And you have the usual social media uh, website, Facebook page, Twitter, etc., Instagram as well. These and Zynga lectures come out of this fact. So in 2012, um, we found that, that there was this diabolical statistic. Um, now it's like 25, but at the time it was, it was 18. So as you can see, there's this terrible lack of black female academics uh, in academia. And we thought, what could we do to address that, that lack, that disparity? So we began to organize what we call the Queen and Zinga Lecture Series, whereby we would get hold of a 100, 200 seat uh, physical venue. We'd um, invite a sister who has a uh, expert knowledge or PhD or masters, whatever, to come and speak about their expertise for you know, a couple of hours and then take questions. We, that's, what we do, that's what we did to kind of address this imbalance. So it's been going for about what, eight years now. It was set up by Black History Walks and the National Association of Black Society Schools. And we do them, on, do them on a regular basis. So this is just a list of some of the stuff we've done in the last eight years since 2012. So in each situation there, we've found a venue, got the venue organized, brought in the speaker, it advertised it, promoted it, produced it, et cetera. And then let the um, sisters speak about their area of expertise. And that's just some of the wide variety of topics we've delivered so far. This is one of them, of course. In fact, this is part of, this is part of a two-part um, season on eugenics. So this is part one. And then next Sunday, we have another um, session on eugenics, looking at a slightly different topic. This is a clientele that will come to our events. We used to have them physically on the physical plane, so to speak. And of course, because of the you know, virus, we've kind of gone onto Zoom. But normally we'd be in a physical space. Um, this is actually Birkbeck University. And we'd have our speak and we'd have people come and network and mingle, etc. So this is another venue we use. This is a University of Arts in Elephant Castle. And again, this is the topic here is um, who stole all the black women from Britain? That's basically about media, the lack of black female representation in media. And that was very cool. That's delivered by Dr. Emma DeBerry. And you can actually find that lecture um, on our website, which I'll mention later on. This one about fibers, that's at UCL, another packed house, has about 200 people up in there. And we should do that one again because, as you, well, you may have been on a fibroids affect black women far more so than white women, but there's less research into fibroids and its effects and, you know, the cures, etc. So we should be doing it again in the near future. Now, this is a while ago, we we're looking at hip hop and academia. And we didn't film all of them, but we did film some of them. So some of the Enzing lectures are recorded. And we have a YouTube channel, which is that one right there. And there's about 180, 180 different videos, uh, mostly on black British history, African British history. And it includes at least, I think there's at least 12 of the lectures are actually on there, from Mary Seacole to the hip hop one to the you know, Five Boys one. They're, 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 they're all in there somewhere if you go look for it. But apart from doing the lectures, we also have um, walks and talks and films. And this is some of the stuff, well, there's no films happening now, of course, but this is some stuff that's coming up shortly. So we have your um, online guides to various art galleries because there's lots of black history in the art galleries but if you go to them on your own you never see them or you won't discover them but we have experts who know all this kind of hidden history which is in these galleries in these um, spaces and we kind of show you where it is so you can do a sample um, visit for free online that is and then you can pay for the, the proper main visit if you want to but that's on our website as well um, this we just had this the other day it was a friday and this is an amazing woman Dame Elizabeth Anionwu. She did a fantastic, amazing speech on how she started off being a, 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 a well, an orphan, so to speak, almost an orphan, and then became um, a dame. So it's a really amazing, inspirational, true story. And she's a woman who's very involved in the Mary Sequel statue and also the pioneering treatment of sickle cell. So um, actually, she was on BBC Radio 4 this morning on Desert Island Disc. But if you want more information on her, just buy a book. Her book is called um, 
Blessings of a Mixed Race Union in Cambridge, I think it is. But like, you can find out more about her just by Googling her name. This is part two of this session or season on eugenics. So it's all about how some of the ideologies you're going to hear in today's lecture can be found in popular TV shows. And you might not realize it when you're watching the shows, but that ideology, that theory that we're thinking is often used as a plot device or you know, story element. Um, and if you come to that one, you, you can find out all about it. And this again, it's my doctor, Dr. Sherman. And um, this is looking at popular culture. A man called Jim Kelly was a big uh, martial arts star back in the 70s and the 80s too, actually. And his influence on young black people in this country because in the 70s, you are quite at likely to be physically attacked just for walking on the street because you're black. So a massive number of self-defense groups were set up and a lot of young people got involved in martial arts. So we're looking at a link between this um, African-American kind of um, superior of the big screen in the 70s and the fight for equality in this country, the physical fight for equality in this country. We have a number of literal street fights including the guy who was um, on the streets fighting against these National Front racist people in the 70s and it's now going to be gone on to become a six Dan black belt and open his own 30,000 square foot gym up in um, North London. This is a lecture by Professor Joyce King. She's looking at how we can use education for liberation. And she's like a real big deal in America. As you can see there, Benjamin E. Mays and Dow Chair of Teaching. Um, and she's bringing her expertise to this, this country via Zoom. And that is on the 17th of June. And this is what we're here for today. So this lecture will be de delivered by Dr. Chantella Sherman. She's written a book called In Search of Purity, which is all about eugenics. And without further ado, Dr. Sherman, if you're ready, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to you to deliver the talk for about an hour or so. So I'm going to stop sharing now, Dr. Sherman, over to you. You there, Dr. Right. Sherman? Yep. Um, <laughs> all right. So. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm going to get right into this, I believe. Um, let's see. Tell me what you can see on that side. Um, I can see your face at the moment. I can't see your screen just yet. Okay. <laughs> it's coming. All right, so uh, got your screen. It's not full screen. That's just into There you go. You got me? Yeah, that's it. You're good to go. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, eugenics is something that um, has resurfaced in some people's um, opinions and estimations. However, as a historian who studies eugenics, I can tell you that eugenics never actually went away. Um, it's been with us almost since the inception of um, colonial bodies, and it's traveled near and far with the folks who decided to create this in order to define who they were and to define the world around them. Um, unfortunately, that has meant that many of us have been placed under um, a certain type of categorization um, that we don't quite understand even though we live under it. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples before we move into the lecture itself. Um, beginning in, say, 1840, up until very, very recently, um, we've had instances where prison bodies um, within the United States actually you know, decided that in order for a, pay, a, a prisoner to be released, they had to be sterilized, the female inmates mostly, um, and some male inmates, but specifically, black females were sterilized as a condition of their release and parole from prison. And a lot of folks couldn't understand exactly why until people who study eugenics began to look at the protocol and the rationale behind it. And it basically found with several investigations that the women sterilized um, in these prisons had had five or more pregnancies um, and they had been tested for their proficiency in reading um, and it had been determined that they were breeders of retardation. They were breeders of poor stock. They were breeders of um, other people who would be a burden on society. And for those who study eugenics, you understand that this is a direct correlation back to the origins of eugenics, which we'll get to in just a moment. 
also, um, sterilizations, again, are not new. And so we've had several instances in the United States um, recently where several states have decided to apologize formally for uh, sterilization processes and protocol and offer reparations to um, some of the folks who were um, sterilized under these programs. The, the place that's um, before you right now, the Ralph sisters, uh, Mary Alice and Minnie, they were 12 and 14 years old, which means number one, they were underaged. But they were considered to be a threat to society, to the state of Alabama, because they were young girls and their neighbors decided that there were too many little boys that seemed to be hanging around their back door. And they reported them to the police and to the state health department who came around unceremoniously, picked them up, in 1973 and took them to a health facility where they sterilized both females, gave them full hysterectomies at ages 12 and 14. There was no consent from the parents and basically under the law, um, and these are state laws, but they're also federal laws in some instances. The law is that if it can be determined that you are a social defective, someone who um, is mentally or socially a burden on the state, you can be sterilized without your permission because it's for the greater good of the state and it's for the greater good of the nation that you do not reproduce. So understanding that a lot of the things that we're talking about right now, um, I'm talking present day, but they have their origin in eugenics that began roughly 1840, all right? Um, and so for those of you who don't know the term eugenics, sometimes you may hear it listed um, as social Darwinism or you may hear it as scientific racism. These are basically codified words of saying eugenics. And eugenics is the science, it's a fake science, to be clear. The science of better breeding, or the belief that you can improve the human population by tampering with the ability of people to have children. And so the concept originally came about as an agrarian thought, meaning it came from the idea that as you plant different types of crops, or you breed different types of animals on a farm. A scientist decided if we're breeding for better crops and for better stock, why can't we breed the American population to breed out the things that we don't want and to breed in the things that we do? And so you start to have um, a, a system that's set up to determine who has value to their lives. What are the things that we want to keep and what are the things that we want to throw away? And you can understand very clearly that when you add race to this and white supremacy is at the top of this, then obviously black bodies will almost always be at the bottom of this, this chain of, of human existence. And so you immediately get attempts um, to breed out blackness um, from the general society. And so what we have is an idea, again, scientifically, that within your DNA, um, there are traits that are not just your eye color and your hair texture and your height that you're getting from your parents, but also their characteristic traits, their behavioral traits. And so things like lying, theft, immorality, criminality, poverty, your mental aptitude, all of these things were believed to have been in the DNA of your parents and your grandparents. And so to ensure that the right people bred with the right people to produce the type of stock that America wanted. You had to insist that with a marriage license, um, you're, you're, you were tested. And you were tested given a, a whole series of examinations that were both written and visual as well as having measurements of your own body taken. And this becomes important and we'll get to this, but it becomes important because at some point, it's almost impossible with the race mixing through rape and coercive sexual relationships under enslavement, it's almost impossible to determine which children on a plantation were enslaved children and which ones were the free children of the slave owners as opposed to um, arbitrary white men who came by in addition to the, the white men who worked the plantation um, who have raped these black women. So you had to do certain measurements um, that dealt with the thickness of lips, um, the wideness of nostrils, the space between the eyes, and under eugenic protocol, there were 208 separate measurements that were taken of the human body to determine what the actual race of a person was. And so you went through these types of examinations in order to get marriage licenses. You did them sometimes in school. 
um, you did them at university, they were done in hospitals and any type of institutions, including penal institutions. So that first slide, when we talk about the measurements that we're taking of these ladies in order to determine whether or not they should be sterilized as a condition of their release or parole from prison, these were some of the same tests that were given to these folks or that were instituted back in 1900, in 1850 and 1860 to determine who was black, who was white, who was considered fit, and who was considered unfit. And the lean of this is always, please always remember, once we get into eugenics, there is a branch of eugenics that deals specifically with black people that black people orchestrated for themselves. And under that form of eugenics, it's fit over unfit as opposed to race necessarily. And you'll get into things like colorism um, and geography. So if people from the South are less than those that are from the North, people who are undereducated or uneducated are less than those who are educated, and those who are dark skinned are less than those who are light skinned. These again are theories that all grow out of this original construct of eugenics. And so within eugenics, you have two different layers, the positive eugenics and the negative eugenics. Now in your mind, you may be saying all of it is negative eugenics. However, under the scientific right under the scientific labeling positive eugenics says that those who have absolutely great genes you come from a good family um your family believes in music you have a high iq test um everyone is teetotal no one drinks no one fornicates which is almost um impossible but um the belief was that the people who had great genes and had been bred well should reproduce with each other and only with each other all right those who had negative traits, those who could be identified as um, using alcohol, um, being involved in illicit or, or um, extramarital affairs, young girls who had had sex out of wedlock. Um, and please understand that things like sexual molestation and rape don't factor into this. Um, if you were considered sexually active by, by force or willingly, um, you fell into this category of negative eugenics. Um, and so other traits, um, if anyone in your family, say you, you've done none of these things, but you have a family member um, going back two or three generations that may have been known as the town alcoholic or um, a mother or aunt who had had a relationship out of wedlock, because they weren't doing strict blood tests at this point, everything was based upon the word of someone else. And so if you had negative traits, the goal was to keep you from reproducing at all. All right, and so under that, um, the only way that you could keep that from happening was to segregate these bodies from others um, or to sterilize um, through surgical methods to keep them from reproducing. And so when we get to the testing stage, um, these are a couple of examples of what the tests look like. Um, you can understand how many people failed these tests. Um, they were under what were called Goddard and Binet testing, and they were used by the military, for instance. They were used at Ellis Island for immigrants who were coming in to determine, you know, since no one's speaking English necessarily, and those who are speaking English don't speak it all the same way. Or you, geographically, you refer to some things by one name, and in another area, you refer to them by another. So you can't really standardize a test in the sense that everyone has the same base of knowledge in order to pass the test. And so what was decided was where they could do a, a, a literal test, then they would do that. But most people took the test as a visual um, one, the one that's on the right. So the basically an instructor would come and say, what's missing on the first row? What's missing on the person? And you would have to draw in the lips in one instance, the eyes in another, the nose in the other, and a hand on the other. The point, though, is if you are um, someone who does not speak the language, and please understand that enslaved Africans coming out of enslavement would not have had access necessarily to um, the same type of literary advantage, um, the literacy that others did. And it was against the law to teach or to learn or to let it be known that you could read or write. So sometimes in order to keep from losing your life, you failed these tests on purpose, all right? Then you would say, well, okay, you've been tested. What does this mean? It means now you go into another area where the measurements are actually taken. And this is what I was talking about with the 208 different measurements. 
Um, this is usually a three page chart. If you look on the right side, that's usually a three page chart. Um, and it has all of these different measurements that have to be taken with relation to um, fingertips, eye sockets, ear holes, um, toes, the length of toes, all types of things. And it was a very ridiculous science on the one hand. And I, just to give you an example, um, many of you have in grade school um, done this little project where you put your hand on a piece of paper and you trace and outline your fingers um, along this outline on a sheet of paper. A lot of times they would say, oh, you've made a little turkey or whatever. You put your name on it, but in many instances, the teacher would keep that sheet of paper. The reason why they're keeping that is because this was an old eugenic um, test to determine a bit of aptitude about you. And it wasn't that you could circle or trace your hand. The goal was to determine if your index finger, the one next to your middle finger and between your middle finger and your thumb, if that finger was longer than your middle finger, it was determined that you had the traits for potentially being a thief. That's called a pickpocket's finger, all right? So as ridiculous as that may sound, these measurements were, were kept and they were coded. And the ones that you're seeing right now um, are actually from Tuskegee Institute, which was a historically, is a historically black college in the United States. So these were black people at this point measuring other black people to determine what their aptitude was and their abilities were based upon the measurements of their body. The Eugenics Records Office, which was begun um, by Francis Galton and Charles Davenport, 1840 to 1900, the organization gets its footing. And by the time we get to 1910 through the 1940s, um, the Eugenics Records Office is taking measurements and funding the measurements of black bodies at state institutions, whether it's colleges, universities, asylums, um, anywhere that they can think of to get these measurements. And the goal was to determine who was fit, who was unfit. And it's to basically say within the black body, there is a race trait that determines that all black people are considered to be subhuman and therefore they're, they're not worth the breeding. They have bad stock. And so within this classification, um, you'll also see, many of you have heard terms like idiot, imbecile, um, moron. Those were terms that are actually eugenic terms that came to define a person's aptitude based upon those measurements that we just got finished talking about. Between the measurements and the test, it would be determined what your aptitude, your mental aptitude was. And if your aptitude was between one and three, a one and three year old, you were considered an idiot, low grade imbecile between four and six years old, medium grade imbecile seven and nine years old, high grade imbecile 10 or 11 year old, and the moron 12 to 13 years old. Um, most African Americans in this country outside of enslavement, it was believed that they did not have the aptitude for many things, even if they tested extremely high and they were off the chart and they were considered to be genius. Um, a lot of times they were restricted within that space to a grade level of medium grade imbecile, which meant they had to aptitude. If you can see on this chart, it tells you what the person is able to do as far as their, their jobs. And so you'll start to see simple menial work, simple manual work, um, and then some complex manual work. And usually African-Americans were placed between high grade and low grade imbeciles where simple manual work is what was believed they actually had the capacity for. It was believed that black minds stopped developing at a certain point. And so because of this, you did not want black women to breed. You did not want them to have children. If you wanted them to have children, it would be in a space where you could control not only their reproduction, but their production. Their children were not to go, to go to school. Their children were to immediately become a part of the workforce and the labor force. And so because of that, you understood that you were putting duress on a family and you were convincing many black women not to have children or to delay having children because of the crises and the trauma that may have been involved in having children that you understood would be restricted from actually enjoying their lives um, in a concrete and, and livable way. And so what you start to have are thousands, I dare say millions really, um, millions of Americans that over the course of about 80 years um, went under the knife um, and were sterilized under public health mandates across this nation. 
Um, we've had instances um, with uh, the Buck versus Bell case, which started out in 1924 and went all the way to the Supreme Court, where there were three generations. Um, one woman had been drinking. They considered her to be a drunkard. Her daughter was molested um, and became pregnant. And at that case, it, in, in, at that point, um, Carrie Buck, it was determined um, as a pregnant teenager, even though she had been raped, because her mother had also been an alcoholic, she became the test case for the Supreme Court. And it was determined um, they could not have any more imbeciles. That is the way the law came down. The state had a right to sterilize her based upon the fact that they, they had shown that there were two generations of uh, feeble-minded people, which meant in addition to being either moron or imbecilic, these other terms, there was also a sexual component to it, which meant she was having sex early and she had begun to reproduce early. Um, the child that uh, Carrie Buck had, they determined a eugenicist came in, looked at the baby, did measurements on the baby, and at three months old determined that the baby was also considered to be um, a dysgenic, um, tainted baby. Um, and so it is, you know, under my research, I found that the youngest that uh, a sterilization has ever been performed in this country was the age of three. All right. Um, and the first U.S. state to enact a sterilization law in 1907, I know you can't actually <laughs> answer me, but believe it or not, it was not in the South. It was, you know, it was the state of Indiana. Um, so I want you to understand how broad the scope is as far as sterilization laws and protocol. At the time, the sterilization law, Carrie Buck is a white female. The sterilization law in Indiana impacted more white females than it did uh, black females. But the issue at that point was that you had a lot of white females who were entertaining black men. And it was, it was understood that these weren't cases or instances of rape. It was, there was no coercion in it. And in order to keep these white women from producing black babies or brown babies, um, it was determined that they needed to be sterilized as well. So once again, you're seeing um, the dismantling of blackness, even if it's a mixed race black child, um, to keep the purity within the national scheme of things. And so within education, what you start to see is that eugenics starts to point out really, really early um, in children that black people reproduce animals as opposed to reproducing children. This is from um, a textbook called Applied Eugenics by Paul Popineau from 1918. It's my understanding that this book was still in production in the 1970s, all right? And what you see here is a chimpanzee, a gorilla, an orangutan and a little black boy all in a tree. Under eugenics, the concept is that black people, anyone of African descent is at the top of the orangutan scale and at the bottom of the human scale. And so it is for that reason that when we get into things, our laws in America, for instance, that say things like, uh, whether it's the Dred Scott case or Plessy versus Ferguson, in each one of these, you'll see some line that says, this is a subhuman or subspecies. Africans, African-Americans, Black people, Negroes, color, doesn't matter how you change the name. At some point, you'll see the language that, said, that says this is a subspecies or a subhuman. This is where you start to see that socially, the cues are coming from the medical and the scientific. And so you're using scientific false information that says that Black people are animals, they're part of the monkey chain rather than the human chain to determine that Black people cannot go to the same schools, they cannot be in the same housing, and their women must not, cannot reproduce this animalistic strain that, had, that can threaten to take over the nation. It's all about population and continuing to keep the numbers of Black births down as much as possible. And so you start to see again how Jim Crow, the idea of segregating people in America, comes largely from the concept of eugenics. And so this is exactly the, the piece that I'm speaking of. Um, there's a piece in here, we think not. The Negro considered as a subordinate and inferior class of being who had been subjugated by the dominant race and whether emancipated or not, yet remain subject to their authority, has no rights and privileges, um, but such as those held in power and government might choose to give them. They're saying that these folks, black people, are a subspecies and a subhuman uh, group. Um, separate and equal becomes the language of the law in this country. And quite frankly, when we get to 
um, laws that deal with miscegenation or race mixing or a black man and a white woman or a black female and a white man decided that they're going to get married, it becomes illegal across the board in the country for the most part. And the language of the law statewide, state by state, which you'll see is it says it's a form of bestiality. Why? Because one person is a person and the other is part animal. And so in their estimation, in the estimation of the legal bodies and the institutions of this nation, that was a form of bestiality and it was against the law. And it was against the law to a point where you could be arrested and jailed or run out of the state if you did get married. Military service, once again, um, this is a, a note that comes from the Army War College of America, and I'm always um, amazed by this because the War College of America is directly across from where I live. So when I see this building, um, I know that the person in 1925 who had to deal with not wanting black men in the military, they make the statement and it's here. In the process of evolution, the American Negro has not progressed as far as the other subspecies of the human family. The psychology of the Negro based on heredity derived from mediocre African ancestors cultivated by generations of slavery is one from which we cannot expect to draw leadership material. Now we can stop right there. Even though this is the, the military, you're making one a statement against the black woman's womb. The second thing that you're doing is saying, this is physical, it's psychological, it's hereditary, and it goes into all aspects of professionalism. So when you say there aren't a lot of black women, there aren't a lot of black people in, in higher professional spaces, a lot of folks are still going back to this 1925 document. Please understand, we've gone from enslavement, 1840 with the beginnings, um, the roots of, of eugenics, through a process of sterilization knowledge, um, which is 1907 moving forward. And then by the time we get to 1925, where we've already had the First World War, and Black men across the globe have shown that they have the ability to be courageous and valiant and, and, and to do the, 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 the job, and they have power and their masculinity is there. All of a sudden, you have in the higher offices of the military these notes that are being passed that says, we do not want Black men here because they have a crowd psychology, and one of the themes that goes on and on throughout this 33-page document, um, it is available on, back online through PDF. Um, it says over and over again, black men will not uphold the rules and will more than likely go into these European spaces and rape white women. So we're right back once again to the idea of losing the purity of the white women through these animalistic black men who've been bred by black women who have no morality. And so to get to the idea of nation builders, um, white women were believed to be the nation builders of, of the world, basically. But in America, it took on a, a totally different tone. And so within um, the American Medical Association, they joined with the Eugenics Records Office to decide, you know, we need to have our babies. It's not enough to have someone tested once they get to school or in college or join the military and have these measurements done. We need to have these measurements done from the time that these babies come out of the womb. And based upon that, we're gonna show again that this is something that's congenital. It's something the mothers are breeding either something that's pure and useful or something that's barbaric and that will cause the nation problems. And so what you start to have are scorecards um, where you have baby contests that arrive um, and fitter families. The Eugenics Records Office sponsored um, a fitter families contest each year with the state fair in individual states. And they gave away prize money um, to the families, white families who had a lot of children and the children looked great and their measurements um, were considered to be on par with what was considered um, the American standard of fitness. Um, and so out of this, um, you'll also have what most of you will recognize um, as this disassociation with blackness and black women's bodies. Um, and so at the same time that you're trying to keep black women, you know, out of the foray, they're being raped um, in large number. Um, many black women are moving into cities and off of, plantation, uh, off of plantations out of, um, out of these planter farms, um, sharecropping farms. They're moving into cities where they're rooming in white people's homes and their bodies are constantly under 
examination and exploitation. And so I'll get to this in a minute, but most of you remember the hot and tot Venus. I'm Star J. Bartman, I'm the Coisentine who was, was brought from South Africa over to, to London at some point and then finally into Paris, where her body was considered to be um, lascivious and hypersexual. Just visually looking at her body was considered to be, um, it was a site of degeneracy. And that is exactly the way it was placed. Understanding even clothes, Black women's bodies were being surveyed constantly and they were being conscripted to a space of her body is defiling the nation or is creating a space where white men um, are lusting after her. So her, her presence creates a problem for the white family. And so you have people that would say, we wanna have a live-in maid um, so these Black women are no longer with their own husbands or kids. They're living in a house um, on the property of a white family and can only go home once a week. And so their families are left to destitute in some instances because they're not there to physically raise their kids or support their husbands. But at the same time, their bodies become the site of trauma and terrorism under these white men that, are hap that happen to be in those households. And so what you start to see is that the black woman's body becomes a site of degeneration. Um, there are several books that deal with as long as the black woman's body was for the function of white economics or white pleasure, the children become beside the point. The children become part of the labor force. The children become a part of her wealth. But as soon as there's no room to exploit those children or her body anymore, there are calls to all of a sudden sterilize Black women as well or put them on birth control um, that would eventually cause them to be sterile. If a woman starts taking a pill every month at the time that she's 11 or 12 years old to quote unquote regulate her period, um, which is done <laughs> by the mind in an amazing way um, without the help of pills, when that woman gets to be you know, 30 years old, 25, 30 years old, gets married and decides she does want to have children, she all of a sudden realizes she's having trouble getting pregnant. And this is the reason why. Several of the medications that were uh, specifically touted for Black women were found later on to be toxic or would cause self-sterility um, at some point. And so that needs to be addressed. But this is something that started in enslavement and continues to some extent to this day. And the issue on this um, again, is that on a, on a plantation, this woman has no agency over her own body and what can and cannot be done with it. Even her medical care um, is in the hands of the enslaver and the physician. The enslaver and the physician have a conversation about what to do with her and whatever aches and pains that she may have. And it sets up a discourse that we still deal with today where Black women, no matter what type of pain you may be in, you will seek the advice of another Black female, an elder, but you will not listen necessarily to white physicians or white medical body because you understand that your body is being um, exploited and you're vulnerable in a space where you understand that you're not being seen um, as a human, but as a subspecies and a body of dereliction or defectiveness. And so Marion Sims, many, uh, many of you may know him at this point. Um, this man is considered to be the father of obst obstetrics and gynecology. Um, but what he was was basically a barbarian who went around um, practicing um, on black women's bodies. And he would go to slave owners and say, you know, I'd like to get this particular female for two or three weeks, I'll, you know, pay for her lodging, I'll cover her food and whatever else. But basically his job was to do surgeries and experiment on these women's bodies. Um, and if the women died or something else happened to them, it was just chalked up to, um, she could not withstand the experiment, um, but the experiment itself would not be considered a failure. Her body would be considered the failure. Um, also please note, um, that during this time, it was believed that Black people, especially Black women, did not feel pain in the same way that white women did. And so many of these operations were done with what they call live subjects, meaning there was no anesthesia given. All right. Um, basically, this woman is held down and these operations are done with her fully awake if she could stay awake. Um, but it was to make sure that they could see, he could see how the organs operated um, 
while the person was alive and without sedation. So once again, it sets up a space where Black women tend to not trust medical bodies at all, or they trust elders, um, holistic practitioners, a lot more than they would um, these folks. And this is part of the reason. Also oh. understanding, <laughs> also understanding that um, the black body is supposed to be the antithesis of whiteness and reproduction. You start to get um, the belief that all black women, all black females from the time they're born have a type of sexuality that's ingrained in them so that a child that's six or seven years old could be raped by a white man and the white man could say that the child enticed me. Um, she's, she's a black kid, she, she knew what she was doing, she did this to me. Um, and so there's this concept of unrapeability. The unrapeability of black females means that no matter what happens, it is the fault of these black women. And so you have a lot of narratives, slave narratives, and then right out of that to the present, if a black woman is sexually violated, she tends to keep that to herself. She tends to suffer in silence. But the one thing she tends to avoid is going to the law because it's understood she will be questioned about why she was there, what clothing she had on, did she not get paid? If the man, the law in America was, if a man gives you money, means he's raped you and he throws a quarter at you, he throws a dollar bill, um, he throws a pound at you when he's done, that's considered a transaction and he cannot be arrested for it. And these are laws that are on the books. Um, I invite you to go into to some of these websites. I think the, the, the internet is a wonderful thing when you're looking for research because this was considered science and it was considered protocol at the time. So no one thinks to hide these records now and you can see what was said the way it was said and there's very little room for reinterpreting it. It is what it is. And so that is the language of the law with that. When you start looking at black women's bodies and white women's bodies and talking about black women's bodies as sites of hypersexuality and then the reproduction of degeneracy, there's something else that grows out of this in a popular way. And since I can't ask you and actually have you answer me, I'll just tell you that what you get is the Miss America pageant that would later turn into um, the Miss Universe pageant, the Miss USA pageant, the Miss whatever pageant. But all of these were originally designed by the American Eugenics Society. Um, they decided to build upon the Better Babies and Fitter Families contest that they were having at state fairs and to create um, a, a, an ideal. This is what the white American ideal of fitness looks like. And so this is the first Miss America who was there in 1925. And the goal a lot of times when state fairs would take place is to have what they also called human zoos. Okay, and so what you would do is on one side of the boardwalk all the way down, you have fitness and American strength and you have American beauty and you have health and th this is what beauty looks like. This is what intelligence looks like. This is what power looks like. And as you go down the boardwalk, you get into what they call the other, the otherness areas, um, the savage areas, the incivility areas. And at the very, very end of this, almost trying to show a direct polar opposition you have African women, or you have some black women who've been paid at this point um, to dress up as African women. They were usually paid um, to go through, stand down, act like they were shooting bows and arrows. Um, the white people came through, they fed them, they petted them like they were at a petting zoo. And the, again, the idea was to give you visually um, this connect where you see what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. And you start to say, this black woman can only breed foolishness, contempt, crime, disease, all of these other things. And you immediately start to, to make that part of um, the language of segregation, separating the races, keeping them separate because these black women can only breed something that we don't want in this society. And so Miss America and that eugenic whiteness, that eugenic fitness becomes a part of national, the national culture, the patriotism of the nation. And so it, that's the reason why you get to the 1980s, the late 1980s, to get the first Black Miss America. And at that point, they wanted to take the crown from her. To make sure that everyone was on the same page um, with these, these um, beauty contests, um, what you see is a chart that was given to folks who wanted to have beauty contests in their neighborhoods or their areas. And you can see beneath the women, there's also um, some guidelines for what a, a good looking prize cow looks like or heifer. 
um, just to make sure that you understand that this is still an agrarian thought. Using the chart, it would tell you, you these are some of the bodies, the types of women that you'll have come forward. Um, who are you to determine is the, the ideal American beauty? And it tells you in little, little tiny print, and I can see it from here and I know the answer, but number seven is what was considered to be the ideal white American body. This was considered to be fit. And within the notes, it says clearly, she is not supposed to arouse you sexually. Your wife is not supposed to arouse you sexually. The whole point of your wife being there is to reproduce this nation, is to reproduce exactly what it is that we believe is the national fit body. And you wanting to sexually be with her is beyond the point. That's not what you're there for. And so you start to see this mimic over and over again. So I would ask, when you look at the Miss America pageant or the Miss UK pageant, I don't know if you're having them there like that, or the Miss Universe pageant, how far away from number seven today um, is the winner or are the, have the winners been in the last five or 10 years? Are we still using the same eugenic protocol um, to determine what is considered fit and what is considered beautiful? Again, the black woman's body is the site for terrorism. Um, it was understood that most black women's bodies were available to white men. And based upon that, this is a, a letter that was found um, in Rosa Parks notes. Um, our famed civil rights um, leader and our stalwart uh, leader for women. Rosa Parks had many instances where um, she was working as a babysitter or she's working in a space where she's with white men and um, it comes off as a, uh, 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 this man is asking her, you know, in a polite way, can I spend time with you, this, 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 and this, um, and then letting her know, if you tell me no, um, then I can make it difficult for you, meaning he would rape her. Fortunately, Rosa Parks was able to, to, you know, simmer the whole situation by attacking the man verbally and just asking him, what is wrong with your white women that you don't want to have sex with them? Why would you come to me, a Negro, and debase yourself in such a way. She used the language of white supremacy and eugenics to force him out of the room. And it shamed him to a point, you know, why would you debase yourself to be with a Negro when you have all of those wonderful white women out there? And it made him back down and she quit the job immediately. But you understand how often um, these types of, of negotiations, either I'm going to rape you or you're going to do this willingly um, and make it seem as if you're actually okay with it. This happened constantly and often. One of the jobs that Rosa Parks had um, within the NAACP before the whole bus boycotts was going down through the South and taking the testimonies um, for the federal government of black women who had been raped or had filed charges of being raped. Um, and what you have here, there's a wonderful documentary uh, called The Rape of Reese Taylor that deals with a young black woman um, who was 23 years old at the time. She's on the lower half on the left. Um, Mrs. Reese Taylor was leaving church when a group of white men took her into a field by shotgun, um, into a field. They gang raped her and then threw her in the yard of her, her front yard of her house. She was able to identify the men. They were neighbors of hers. Um, they didn't have masks. Um, and basically she filed charges, but the state, the county refused to actually prosecute the men. So Rosa Parks had to go down and force them to try and do a prosecution. And instead, keep in mind, this is 1944, we're in the middle of a war. Each and every one of those seven men, their families got together and enlisted them in the military during the middle of a war to keep them from being indicted for the rape of this woman. Um, the high note to this, if you wanna say that there is such a thing, um, each and every last one of those men met a horrific death. Um, and it's unclear in the documentary exactly who did it, but um, justice was served in a rather roundabout way. In the meantime, Reese Taylor lived to the ripe and wonderful old age of 98 years old. She was able to see Barack Obama in office. Um, he hosted her at the White House. Um, but the understanding was this woman lived an additional 40, 50 years understanding that her rapists and their families were right there. Um, 
their goal was to keep her from reproducing other children. This was an intelligent woman. Her husband worked with the NAACP. And so her body became the site of terrorism in the sense that they wanted to ensure that they broke her body, quote unquote. All right. And so by the things that they did to her, um, yes, it was established that she was unable to have additional children after that. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer, um, another amazing leader out of Mississippi, spoke about the fact that rape was also often considered um, by and parcel um, a part of white supremacy. The idea was if you upset, it wasn't even about the woman, but if you upset a man by raping his wife, um, you'll somehow call his activity um, as a vigilante or wanting voting rights. Um, you can burn down his house, but the other thing that you could do is rape his wife. And so Fannie Lou Hamer, in giving testimony um, at one point, she gave a speech and talked about the fact that her grandmother had had 23 children. Her grandmother was married. She had 23 children. 20 of the 23 children were the product of rape by white men. Indiscriminate white men who came by in fields or saw her somewhere, threw her on the ground, raped her. So she has 20 children that are the product of rape. And so um, in the whole scheme of white supremacy, to keep black people from reproducing, to stop reproducing blackness, you also have this other little piece that deals with the family unit. And when you have a married man who understands that every time his wife gets pregnant, he's unclear whether or not this is his child and his wife is not in a space where she can necessarily say from within the trauma, I have been raped and understanding that it may cost her husband his life if he tried to go in and defend and protect her from this. Um, also, there were several instances, there are constant issues of black um, colleges in towns where black colleges are. Sometimes teenagers, college students want to go out to a makeout point um, and they will always have white men who would scout those areas, pull guns or knives, make the men run off, the, the boyfriends run off, and then rape the women. And so the idea was to try and reform um, black womanhood, even though it wasn't about reforming us, it was about really keeping us, um, in some instances, out of danger, out of the line of fire, um, or as the state would say, we were being wavered. Um, and so it was to keep us out of danger, keep us out of the gaze of, of white men, to keep us protected in some instances. And so you have two different layers of this. You have some of these institutions, um, homes for wayward girls, industrial schools, that came about because you had black female leaders who decided, I'm gonna give these young girls um, a, a place where they can learn a trade. And in doing so, they won't be in the households of white men and subject to that type of, of violation. And then if they decide to get married, and we can talk about uplift and respectability, we can get to a point where we're seen as women and feminine and genteel as opposed to the site of danger, um, the site of sexual immorality, and the breeders of children um, that the society does not want. At the same time, you had homes that were established by white bodies and by the state who specifically wanted these women in to one, sterilize them, keep them from having babies, but to give them a trade where they would then be pushed into white people's homes and their violation would never be known because babies would not be produced even if disease or trauma was. Um, prisons, this is a, a photo um, of Mississippi's parchment um, prison. And a lot of times when we, talking about, we talk about prison camps, we talk about black men. But as you can see, these are young black girls for the most part. Um, and there are a few elder women um, in the photo, but for the most part, these are children. And again, the idea was as soon as you can get a female who's of age where she can reproduce, if she looks wrong, if she sasses a police officer, if she um, is seen outside and, and during school hours or anything where you could bring her in under the law, you bring her in, you put her on a work farm, you take her before the sterilization board, and at some point within that three to four week period when she's first there, she's tested, determined to be defective, and she's sterilized. Um, again, people migrating, black people migrating from the south into the north, a lot of times they would stand at bus stops and they would be arrested um, because they looked like they were deficient. And so this is a photo right here. The police picked up so many people in Chicago that sometimes they would just line them up against the wall and you see the measurements 
um, where they would just line them up one at a time. You can see none of these people are dressed as pimps or prostitutes. They're on their way to work, all right? But they were arrested nonetheless um, for either loitering, vagrancy, um, social deficiency, and the little notes at the bottom, each time you're brought into a prison, um, you're also given IQ tests and your, your, mental, your mental ability is noted. And so you can see with this arrest record, um, mentally deficient girl um, creating friction between her mother and stepfather in 1941, um, diagnosed as mental deficient, high imbecility level, um, indifferentiated type, which means she may be feeble-minded and chances are when you get down to the bottom of this page, it will tell you that um, she was brought in before the sterilization board and determined to be someone who should not reproduce children. Again, going back really quickly to the idea of race mixing, understanding that because you cannot take a blood test to determine at this point um, who's black and who's white, trying to separate genomes and all of that, that wasn't uh, something you could do um, up until very, very recently. Um, when you have a family like the Lovings who are pictured here, husband, wife, and their three children, if you look at the children, um, you would need to do the measurements on the daughter. And if it wasn't uh, apparent to you, this is the daughter of a black woman. And so the belief was that you would end up, this child would have the propensity for immorality, um, vagrancy, criminality, all of these things that's in the mother's bloodline. And then they would automatically claim that the father had to be deficient and he was a criminal because he had had sex with the beast. It's a, this bestiality logic is still there. But the importance of doing measurements becomes really clear when you look at the daughter because you would not be able to tell that this child has a black mother outside of the space with her parents. Also one of the sons, as he got older, um, he also, you couldn't really tell what his, his race was. And that's only important if you're trying to determine racially how to segregate people and keep them from being um, in certain spaces based upon race. And so you see why that becomes extremely important. Now, having said that, this is just a little test I normally do if you're here. Um, if I was there with you, um, but based upon the fact that I said that you have to have measurements, you know, to determine a person's race, looking at the female in this picture, you can pretty much tell that this is a light skinned black female. And it's pretty clear that the man sitting next to her is a white male. Now, if I were to tell you, um, when we start talking about the, the craziness of enslavement, um, and race and how, how ridiculous some of the stuff is, but powerful um, and vicious. This is a picture of Jefferson Davis, the father of the Confederacy. He's 39 years old in this picture, and this is his wife, Verena, who is 19. If we had to do measurements, the thickness of her hair, her nose, her lips, it would be established that Verena, and there was a lot of talk about it at the time, was actually a black woman. So the, the father of the Confederacy, the saying slavery now, forever, and always, black people are subhuman and their animals was in fact married to a black woman all right black eugenics um w.e.b du bois the theory of the talented tenth most people talk about the talented tenth they do not however talk about the other end of that which is the submerged tenth this one theory but we only talk about one portion of it the talented tenth if you're dealing with survival of the fittest 10 percent of any population is supposed to automatically die out all right if under enslavement, plantation owners and slavers allowed all people to, to stay alive, then that means that once we get to emancipation, you have 10% of a degenerate population of black people who were supposed to have died out but did not under natural causes, all right? And so the submerged tenth, if you go back and you read, reread the Philadelphia Negro, which Du Bois published 1904, go back and reread it. What you'll find is he puts down classes or grades of black people. And within it, it reads exactly like the Eugenics Records Office, the Eugenics Academy, where they're talking about different grades of people. And he gets, these are all black people though that he's talking about. And he gets to a point where he talks about the submerged tent. It's a group of black people who are ne'er-do-wells. Um, they're poor, they're loud, they're gamblers, they're criminal, they're diseased. It reads exactly like the language that we just got finished talking about. Um, with the eugenics records office. So you do have black people who talk about eugenics in a very, very different way. Kelly Miller is another man, Howard University scholar, amazing scholar. 
he did a, a whole uh, series of articles called the eugenics of the Negro, where he talked about the fact that the best and brightest among black people who were going to colleges and becoming professionals were not breeding enough. They weren't having enough. And he kept saying, we will become overpopulated. The strong and the mighty and the proud and the intelligent and the fit among us will be overpowered by the weak among us. And so we have to try and figure out if we can breed more or in some way restrict the breeding of those who really don't need to breed their portion of our race. Then you get to Marcus Garvey and black nationalist movements. Now, a lot of folks wouldn't consider uh, Garvey to be a eugenicist in this particular vein, um, but he basically was a eugenicist with the flip uh, theory. He believed that black genes were strong and beautiful and wonderful, and that the darker you were, the more beautiful you were, and the strength of your genes was in its black purity. So he did not believe in race mixing. Um, he did not believe that um, light-skinned black people could be trusted in many instances, and he had good rationale and reasoning for it. If you ever go through, once again, these, these documents are available. The reason why Garvey was deported and put out of the, gov uh, out of the, the nation um, and even brought to the attention of the nation, um, to the FBI, was because of Du Bois and some other um, black leaders who determined that this man was, again, a ne'er-do-well. He was a foreigner. Um, and so the language that's used by Du Bois and others to describe Garvey to white people, to the government, is that his parents were poor, he's a dark um, foreigner, it's all of this, this um, loaded type of language that goes back to a very, very eugenic practical thing that says his father was poor, so there's poverty in his bloodstream. His father did criminal things, so he has to be doing something criminal in everything that he's doing with these people, and he's leading them. And to say at the base of the letter um, that this man, Marcus Garvey, is more of a threat to the nation than the Klan or an outside agitator um, said a lot, but it worked, all right? The Birth Control Review, again, this document is available June 1932. These are Black leaders talking about curbing Black women's ability to reproduce because we're, re we're reproducing too many. So they had an entire edition devoted to um, the Negro number. The, the Birth Control Review, many of you talk about Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood. There was an entire edition in 1932 that dealt specifically with Black women and their bodies. Um, and it was written by black leaders of the time. And so Du Bois is in there. Um, Walter Turnpenning did a, a, a piece that always agitates me um, to no end because he talks about um, human waste. Negroes creating large percentages of humans that need to be on the human scrap pile. Um, they are the least desirable types of black people and we don't really want them in our number. So please understand that as we start to move forward and we talk about the Ralph sisters um, that we talked about in the beginning, the two sisters, 12 and 14, who were sterilized. This wasn't a white woman who came by their house. These weren't white people that in their neighborhood that said, you know, these girls need to be sterilized. These were other black people. We need to be very, very clear that eugenics runs the gamut across different racial lines, but with the same really backwards understanding that you can control population and that somehow poverty is in the DNA and can be transferred from one generation to the next, making people who reproduce, who are poor, um, a burden on the nation and a burden on the state. Um, so these were black people who also co-signed on the logic that we have too many of the wrong types of people who are breeding. Also, you start to get uh, notices when we're talking about reproducing blackness. No one wants to be black. And so you start to have um, these notices and ads that come up about fixing germplasm, and it's actually on the labels um, and in the advertising. Pride in our race demands that we look light, bright, and attractive. So you've attached attractiveness to lightness. Um, we start talking about not necessarily blemishes, but talking about blemishes in character. I can see visually that you're unhygienic, you're diseased, you're dirty, you're, you're dark because of the darkness of your skin. And that is something that's in your DNA, it's in your blood. So they call it germplasm. And so a lot of these preparations beginning the 1910s um, into the 1940s talk a lot about fixing germplasm. This is an ad that appeared in a black newspaper, the Chicago Defender in 1923, full page ad talking about, you know, making black women look as white as possible so that they can get married um, and be considered desirable. 
also another one, um, this is 1928, also from the Chicago Defender, um, the stigma of dark skin and coarse hair. Um, is they're considered to be markers of defectiveness. So all of a sudden, as a, a female, you've determined you don't want to breed what looks like you. Um, or you believe that men won't want to be with you because you look a certain way. Um, and so you have these chemical companies that come about um, trying to make you fix the quote unquote germplasm, the DNA that's within your body. And they will have labels that say things like, we will fix what science or what biology um, broke. Um, the Black of the Berry, um, Wallace Thurman, I think does an amazing job of dealing with um, the concept of genetic throwbacks. What happens if you're a very dark Black woman and the type of psychological trauma that you were dealt with, you, that you dealt with um, in just surviving and navigating um, different spaces. And so what you have within this book um, is the story of a young girl who's highly educated. She's in college, but She's in New York at a time when anytime you tried to get an apartment or a place to live, you would actually have a notice. They would have notices in the windows that say, dark women need not apply. Or if there was a job, um, there were postings where all of a sudden black women were being allowed to work as telephone operators or elevator operators in department stores. And it would say, um, no hard looking women need apply. And then in brackets, it would say, if you're darker than a paper bag, if you, you know, if your hair is coarser than this, if your height is not this, if your weight is beyond this, do not apply. That is considered to be a hard looking woman, meaning you're more akin to either a man or an animal. And we don't want you visually to represent who we are and what it is that we're doing. Oddly enough, um, this concept of the sweet back, um, I know many of you may have heard of the film uh, Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, and that's Melvin Van Peoples, but the, the concept the term sweetback is actually from the 1920s. It was, it started in the Harlem Renaissance and it deals with black women, very, very dark black women who um, could not get husbands or dates or propagate because of their skin tone. And you had light skinned men who served as quote unquote gigolos, um, lovers or fathers of their children just so that they would gain skin currency in a social space. And so the term sweet back is a, a very negative connotation, but it goes specifically to the gigolos um, that, that took advantage of the fact that skin currency means something and that these women wanted to have children, but it was understood a dark skinned man, no matter how dark he was, would not choose a, a dark woman. And so it left them, it conscripted these black women, not just out of the spaces of professionalism, professional jobs, no matter how educated they were, it kept them out of education spaces. It also kept them out of being mothers and wives um, because they were considered to be undesirables. Okay, and so when we get to present day sentiments, um, the concept of a black woman's body being different, this is a, a photo that was taken and it actually, um, this ran in the New York Daily News, if I'm not mistaken. Um, on a White House visit, um, you have the Princess of Spain, the First Lady of France, and then Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama is not even given the respect of a title. Um, First Lady of the United States, it's not there. It's just Michelle Obama. Someone takes this picture of them from behind and says, it's like, a, like two Ferraris and a dump truck. Okay, well, how do you respond to something like that? That's a present day hot and tot sentiment. Um, and again, it goes to body politics. Any black person would look at the, the two white women and say, those look like two kids who need to gain weight. They look like they've been starved. Okay, so it's a, it's a very, very weird concept of having your body um, and who you are um, and your value, quite frankly, determined by not only what you look like, but what you look like comparative to the people who are oppressing you. Mockery. Um, this is... <laughs> uh, a tennis player who decided to mock Serena Williams. Now, this was a, 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 I understand they have a day where they dress up as each other and, and whatever else um, on, on the field. Um, but this was her impersonation of Serena Williams and um, very few people actually found it funny. Right. Okay, and so this basically closes this out for me. I know that I'm trying to, trying to make sure I stayed in that hour vein. I think I made it. Um, if you have questions, I'm prepared to take them um, now. Um, and we can go back with the slides as, as you need to. But um, yeah, if you have any questions, please.
All right. So thank you for that, Dr. Sherman. Um, as usual, a bit mind blowing, a bit kind of <laughs> overwhelming. Um, I'm sure people will be thinking, did this stuff really happen? And of course it did happen. So while people begin to type their questions into the chat, so if you, if you join it, if you want to ask a question, you do it by finding the chat function on your screen and then you type your question into the chat function and then we'll read it out. Um, so while people do that, um, Dr. Sherman, can you tell us um, in the UK and England, in the 1980s, we had an issue with um, black women in that if a sister had fibroids and went to see the doctor, the automatic response was for them to have a hysterectomy to remove their womb, or they would be told to take a drug called Depo-Provera. So do you have experience of Depo-Provera in America, and do you have experience with fibroids being used to um, actually get rid of people's wounds? Um, absolutely, and thank you for that question. Um, it's amazing, uh, Depo-Provera and its predecessor, Gardasil, um, were both drugs that were tested on the Ralph sisters that I talk about with the, the sterilization, the two uh, kids, the 12 and 14 year old. Both of those drugs were tested on them through the public health system in America and were determined to be toxic. Um, and that was one of the reasons why the health care professional decided none of the drugs that we're experimenting on, we, we sent them out as experiments on these black girls because we needed to be able to test to see if they were safe and or effective. Um, it was determined that they were toxic and they pulled them to some extent. Depo-Provera, as far as I'm concerned, is still highly toxic. Um, and basically what it will eventually do is sterilize you chemically. Um, and so that tends to happen when you take this stuff over time. It's a, a, a toxic agent. Um, as far as the, the um, fibroids are concerned, um, I've had them myself to be as transparent as I can be about it. Um, I don't listen to um, the protocol of most American doctors. If it's a black female doctor that I have, um, I use a holistic practitioner um, named Dr. LaJoyce Brookshire. Um, and this is a black female. And so she started telling me um, different things that I could do with my diet that would cause them to shrink. Um, I was told that I could either, either do the hysterectomy or um, do, now they're trying to do this thing where they insert little tiny pellets um, into the cervix or the, the uterus to, to cut off the blood flow to the uh, fibroids themselves. Um, and it's called uh, uh, uterine embolism. And when they told me, oh, you have to go, we have to go through your femoral artery in order <laughs> to put the pellets in. Okay, I am a eugenic historian, but I'm also a medical historian. So you don't touch a femoral artery for any reason. And so I just knew that and I just thought, okay, well, thank you for your information. I went back to the holistic practitioner and it was like, stay away from the following things. Um, milk, anything white, uh, white powder, white sugar, um, nothing that's processed. And then it was a series of different types of tinctures um, that I took and they actually shrank. And so they have disappeared um, at this point. So um, there are ways of getting around this, but the protocol is still pretty much the same. If it's a black person's body, um, say it's a woman who has, uh, she's stressed out. You go to the doctor, they say you have high blood pressure. The immediate thing is to give a black female, a black person a pill. Um, a white colleague of mine, blood pressure goes up. They told him, see if you can find a yoga class so you can learn how to relax. So I asked, what was the difference in protocol? Why would you have a black person take a pill? Well, once you take this pill um, for high blood pressure, it will eventually cause you to have other issues with things like your, your um, glucose level. So when they say black people have diabetes and, and hypertension and they couple them as if it's some type of race trait, is because the medication that you're taking can cause you to have other conditions. And so I don't trust the medication. So just across the board, I tell people, if you can find a holistic practitioner, there are plenty of, of black female doctors that are out there who will tell you, um, go back to the things that your grandparents taught you to do. It's a reason why they live to be 80, 90, and 100 years old. All right, cool. I've got a question from Fayon. They say, thank you for a great talk. The slide with the charts reminded me of the measurements taken by health visitors in the United Kingdom. Does this yes. measurement of our babies have its roots in eugenics? Absolutely. Um, what would be considered a healthy baby? And that's why I said, what's considered to be the norm? How do you, how do you create normatives? Um, you know, I always tell people the growth charts that you use 
um, in schools, the growth charts that the doctors use grew out of um, the eugenic protocol that you saw with the, the um, fitter families and better babies contest. All right. They don't take into, in, into account things like what was the mother's diet? They don't take into account things like, um, is this going to be a small baby because the parents are both small? Sometimes it is a hereditary thing, but you have two parents that are five feet. All right. The baby's not going to come out, <laughs> you know, looking like it came out of a, a six foot man or a six foot woman. So you, none of these things are necessarily taken into account. And the measurements, um, you know whether or not your baby is, is healthy. These measurements in these charts, when they start telling people your baby is not developing at a rate that we consider to be normal, what is normal for your family? If the, and that's why I said we have to make sure that we keep in contact with our elders. These parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts that are of age that can say, no, this is the same size that your mother was when she was born. And it's, it's, everything is fine. So again, um, you're very right. The, any charts that you see are an outgrowth of um, eugenic protocol, whether it's in the military, the school system, or the medical establishments. Yeah, got a um, question from Rihanna. It says here, thank you so much, Dr. Chantel, for such an informative lecture. It was really thought from full, kin and powerful. There's so much that we have to continue interrogating. It's really frustrating and worrying that many of these sentiments remain today. What advice would you give to black women trying to confront these histories within their work? And what suggestions would you recommend alongside education as a form of dismantling colonial legacies? Um, thank you. That's a great question. Great couple of questions. Um, the reality is, you know, the, the change has to come from the folks who are inflicting the issues. However, there are certain things that you can do to, to gird up yourself. Um, and, you know, I, I believe in, you know, biblically they say gird up your loins, forearmed is forewarned. Um, when you know something, pass that information along. And when I'm, I think we have more ability to pass information along that's, that's necessary through social media, but you have to be learned about what it is that you're passing along. Um, I will make sure that it's available, Tony, I'll, I'll send it over to you. But usually when I do these lectures, I give you what I call a cheat sheet, which has some of the terms and some of the language. Um, it has definitions of things. It has a number of books that I think you should always go back to or refer to and commit the information to memory so that you understand what it is um, that's being said. A lot of times eugenics works in, in, in for my purposes, in three functions or spheres. Um, the scientific and medical, the social and then the popular. And right now I think we deal a lot with popular eugenics where it's in our face, people are having conversations all the time in front of us, but we don't necessarily understand what's being said or to what extent. And so you may say, I heard this and it's racist. And then you kind of pull back and go, okay, yeah, I heard it, it's racist, but the person who said it is black. You know, so how do I separate? I know that this, this, there's something with this. And I always say there's a difference between racial and eugenic and they're components of each other but there's a difference and so um case in point very quickly i was at a school board meeting i don't have children but i'm at the board meeting just kind of listening in and most people have left the room to take a break the mics are still hot though so i'm listening to two people talk about young black kids and the fact that the parents want certain changes and one of the people said what's in the bitch comes out in the pups and the other person's response was, um, you know, they're all feral. Now, as a eugenics historian, I was ready to pick up anything I could find and just beat the hell out of them, okay? Because I understood what they were saying in a different type of context. What you're saying is that this woman is breeding animals and we don't have to do for them or provide for them in the school system the same way we provide in other spaces. Um, and so I confronted both of them and explained to them who I was and what I do, um, and that I would be taking um, aim at everything that they said and everything that they put forth as a bill or a protocol or a policy from that moment forward. Um, thankfully, both of them decided to leave the organization. And it was like, all right, this is what I'm talking about as far as knowing what it is that you're hearing when you hear it. So um, learning what the language is of eugenics is very, very important. Um, and they're just key, very few key terms that you need to know about. Um, and then challenging it wherever you are in a very um, 
complimentary type of fashion. I'm not one of these people that's going to tell you, don't go off because it'll make black people look bad. Do what you need to do. <laughs> okay. Um, do what you need to do because it's about protecting yourself and the people around you. And you have to be able to challenge um, racism and eugenic thought because it's in everything. Okay. Um, what made you write your book, Purity? Um, and what is in it that we haven't heard? Well, I suppose it's more detailed than what we heard today. But also, can you give us a sneak preview of next week? So what made you write your book in the first place? And um, sneak preview of next week. Um, I would say with In Search of Purity, it started out as part of my dissertation work, um, working on my PhD. And what I found was that eugenics, I kept thinking, white over black, white over black. And what I started to find within my own community was black over black, fit over unfit. And so it made me go back into everything that I thought I knew about racism and deconstruct it. And deconstruction is important. If you read a book and you go to the, you read the introduction, but you also go through the bibliography, you need to know where the person who wrote the book got their information. And what I started doing was pulling the original documents from the different books that I read and found that eugenics, has been in every society on this planet and it's been in the hands of some of the very people who it's meant to subjugate. And I just really wanted to address that. So In Search of Purity deals with popular eugenics and racial uplift within the black community. I deal with black people in eugenics. Um, and so I think it's important again that you understand how black people internalized and redirected eugenics um, for their own purposes and it was not always good. Um, as far as um, previewing what's coming up, um, because again, eugenics also works within popular culture, I found that in teaching students about eugenics that television and film, the eugenic uh, theories are there. They're all over the place. And it's not just the orphan black where you're talking science. It's the films that you grew up watching. It's Claudine, it's a soldier story. It's um, half of the shows that the it's Coronation Street, it's <laughs> it's EastEnders, it's there. But you're watching, you're laughing where you're supposed to laugh, you're crying where you're supposed to cry, but you don't necessarily see it. And it may not be overt and it may not be specifically racial in tone, but it's eugenic in tone. And so my job was to try and make sure that people could uh, assess what it is that they're watching because you're ingesting things in the same way that you eat, you're ingesting them through television and they're impacting your sleep, they're impacting your health, and you don't necessarily know why you're watching things and they're upsetting you or they're having some type of impact on your emotions. So um, the second session that I do is specifically about eugenics in television and film. Um, and it kind of goes through some of the things that we've watched, our amusements, television, film, radio, advertising, um, where you've seen it but didn't realize exactly what you were seeing. That'll be next week, Sunday, about three o'clock, same time. Um, and your book, can you, you can you can get your book from your website, is that right? Yes, you can get it from the website. You can also get it from um, Amazon. Um, and I would say if you're actually in the UK, um, Amazon or another bookseller would probably be the best route just because you would have to wait for me <laughs> to get it overseas to you. Um, and so um, the Amazon um, or Barnes & Noble or Foils, they should have um, access to it there and you can just order it that way right, we've got a bunch of comments here let me read them out quickly um from p he said or she says thank you for affirming the enlightenment of the continued suffering of our people sharon says fantastic and shocking talk we have a lot to free ourselves from thank you dr sherman lisa george says thank you Sh dr chantella and black history Arts, for a powerful and needed lecture work is appreciated norma says thank you dr chantella very informative Apparently, currently, some mainstream blood pressure medicines are known to be not suitable for black people, yet many doctors still prescribe them to black people. I agree the ancestral holistic approach is the way forward. However, I'm wondering why these conventional medicines, known to be suitable for black people, are still prescribed as standard. I mean, the, the quick answer is um, economically, if I keep telling you that you need it and that you can't do without it, it's an economic, you know, windfall. Um, most in America, I, I love the fact that when I'm in the UK and they show an ad for something, there's a lot of print at the bottom that says, <laughs> no matter what you just saw, basically, don't use this or, you know, enter at your own risk or whatever. In America, that fine print is so fine that you can't read it. So what we end up having are ads that come out maybe two years after a drug is introduced and, and largely um, targeted, targeting black people, you'll get something that says, oh, if you've been the victim of taking this drug and you now have 
had a stroke or you've had um, you know, all of these other life-threatening conditions, please call this law office and we can see about getting you a settlement. Um, the money is in the pharmaceuticals. It's in, you know, um, prescribing medications that people don't necessarily need. We don't deal with holistic approaches, which is Black people get less sleep and drink less water than, than they need. And I'm not, I don't compare us to white people because we are our own. Um, but as a whole, we are not drinking enough water. We're not getting enough rest. And we're not getting enough hugs. <laughs> and so the very things that, that we need as humans, um, we're not getting. And so as a result, we're having um, symptomatic type of, of um, ailments where if we took a vacation, you go on vacation and the whole time you're on vacation, you feel lovely. And when you get back, you're sick all over again. That tells me that there's something else that's going on that's not physical. It's emotional and mental. And I think that we need to deal with that. Uh, June Allison says, this was a brilliant lecture. Thank you. You've confirmed the eugenic link to the fear that some people have about black people. But can you explain the fetishization with black men despite this, please? Well, I think the thing that <laughs> I tend to think that the thing you hate the most is actually the thing that you love the most. Um, and so that's why they called slavery the peculiar institution, um, because Black people are loved and revered and in a way that makes white people feel uncomfortable. This is about, if you read I, the ISIS papers, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing talking about the fact that when you start talking about white supremacy and losing control, feeling like you're losing control because you're not the majority. You know, it's one thing to say, I don't, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to lose my position. I don't want to lose my space. I don't want to lose control. Um, and I believe these are the people who are creating that problem. Every white person in the world still loves Michael Jordan or Michael Jackson or Oprah Winfrey or Barack Obama, whomever, you know, you understand what I'm saying? And they fetishize blackness. So they'll get the lip injections. If people had to do the measurements now, um, it would be amazing. I would love to see it just so I could laugh. But it's like the number of white people with thick lips now who've gotten butt implants or breast implants or taking ribs out so that they can have curvy bodies to look like black women or put lifts in their shoes so they can be taller like black men or whatever the case might be, um, it's there. And so that's why I say I think, I don't believe that racism, white supremacy is based upon anything other than an emotional problem. It's a, a mental, emotional, spiritual issue. Um, that has tentacles into all these other avenues. Okay, Patricia says, no, sorry, CJ says, brilliant talk, thank you. Patricia says, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mind-blowing session, very informative and enlightening. Look forward to reading your book. Claire says, thank you so much, Dr. Chantella, so much great research and not enough time to discuss aspects of your lecture as my most passionate subject and academic major is social research. My question is in reference to the present pandemic here in the UK. I believe there is a strong resurgence of the germ plasm you mentioned. Black women's hair has received much attention, seen as unhygienic and needs to be fixed, washed to prevent contamination of the virus. In my humble opinion, there has been an underlying COVID implication that black sisters, brothers, when you write your questions, you can't write a whole paragraph in there because it, you know, it, it makes it hard to, to put it across. Um, I'll carry on though. In my humble opinion, there has been a Underlying covert implication that black people, particularly black women, are carriers of the virus because of our hair. Many women of African women, many women of African descent have been foremost in delivering the message to other black women that they should wash their wigs, weaves, and hair after returning, returning home each evening, especially in the case of key workers. Once again, I'm outraged at the negative implications and would welcome your thoughts, advice on this. Thank you. Um the there's a piece I have on the screen right now, Acumen Magazine. Acumen Magazine is a, the only African-American history magazine that I know of. And I produced this with a group of, of high school and college students. We produce once every three months or so, but we're dealing right now with a number of articles. So you can just go to the website and you'll see the blog and you'll see a, a particular article specific to um, COVID-19 and just how every time there's been some type of, of disease outbreak in America, um, the goal was to try and immediately shift it to something that was racial, okay? Be clear, whether it was the swine flu, the Spanish flu, and note the names, the, the <laughs> everything is not the white flu, which it really should be. So it's like, okay, right off the bat, there's a problem, but 
black people are not carriers. We are not more susceptible. Um, we are not dying more. And the other thing is you need to understand statistics. I want you to be very, very, very careful when you start quoting and re-quoting statistical information. If you don't understand demography um, or stats, don't do it, all right? Um, and I'm gonna give you a quick example of this. Um, in the city of Richmond in Virginia, it's the capital city, there was an article that came out that said 100% of the people who died from COVID-19 were African-American. So immediately, Black people started, oh my God, it's, you know, and it's, we're doing this, and what are we doing? Is it our hair? Is it this? Is it that? Then somebody said, you, you're preconditioned because you have high blood pressure, you have diabetes. Oh, so I need to take my blood pressure medicine. Everyone's going crazy. I said, show me the statistical information. And it turns out that the 100% represented eight people. Eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, every life is precious, but darling, an epidemic and a race trait cannot be made off of eight people. So I said, were the eight people related? Were they in the same area? What is the commonality between these eight people other than the fact that they're Black? And then it became, oh, well, we really don't want to discuss that, but the articles were pulled because it wasn't true. You can take numbers and make all types of, of crazy speculation off of it. What I do know about black bodies is whether it's the swine flu, smallpox, AIDS, whatever it is, black bodies tend to bounce back, all right? So there's something in these bodies beside melanin that keeps us here. If we were at the whim and will of white folks trying to kill us through medications and viruses, whether it was created and manufactured or just sprung up out of somewhere, we're still here. So you know, be really, really careful with those stats because a lot of times the same people who are exploiting you are putting this information out. All right, Patricia says, you talked of experimentation on black women, example, Marion Sims. Did similar things happen with black men? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, a lot of times with the, the black men, um, if they were inside penal institutions, um, if they went into prisons, um, if they, they were also put in asylums or homes for the feeble-minded. Um, and while they were there, um, doctors who were basically trying to get their, their licenses. Um, these are people who say, again, I need a body. And rather than having a cadaver, a dead body, I have a live body. And I have a, an exorbitant amount, you know, an immeasurable amount of men that I can just pull off the street. Um, there are a number of, uh, there's a documentary, Slavery by Another Name. There's also a companion book. Slavery by Another Name talks about the fact that from the turn of the century up until the 1960s, you had black men that would just disappear. And a lot of times they're coming home from work that, you know, they're walking or they're driving. You see the truck is abandoned and you would have these white men who were like militias um, and they would come by, they would snatch a black man off the street, tell him, you know, I'm arresting you um, for vagrancy or I'm arresting you for loitering. They would take them to a, a, a judge who was right there, um, and the judge would say, I'm fining you $500. You don't have the $500. Well, I'm conscripting your body to the DuPont clan. And so this man has been snatched off the street. His people don't know where he is, but he's been put on a work gang. And so his job, he's chained in a, a, a caravan, basically. He's chained in a caravan with 50 other men, and they're in the mornings, they're let out to, to work like they're enslaved, and their job is to work off the debt. While they're there, any physicians who need a body can get them. Um, if they're in areas where there are a lot of, uh, there's malaria, they're in swamp areas or whatever, people are giving them drugs or putting it in their foods. Also in the military, a number of black men have told me about their experience with something called soft pita. Um, and I don't know what the actual drug combination is for this, but it was believed that black men in the military, when that letter that I showed you coming from the war college said that black men um, weren't acceptable and the government, the federal government still said, no, black men have shown that they have valor and all of this. We're going to we're going to integrate um, the military. The white men in the military decided to keep black men from having access to white women. What we're going to do is put soft pita, some type of agent that's put in the food. And it's usually the mashed potatoes or some type of starch. They put it in the food to keep the men from being able to have erections. It's no telling 
what was in this concoction or this combination um, of drugs that was put into the food. And I've had at least 10 or 15 black men who've been in the military in America who've told me about this particular product. Um, they don't know what was in it, but it was in their food. Um, and so there have been experiments in any type of institution where black man is held and has to be the military, prison. So when we talk about prison overcrowding, I always believe that there's something else to that as well. Um, so yes, just be, be clear, black men also um, have suffered greatly at this. Black women present a different type of issue because their wombs are, are the site, like I said, of um, building a nation or tearing a nation down. Right. Adelaide asked, um, as a recently, recently qualified midwife, I know that the history around Marion Sims is not being taught to midwives or medics. It feels like such a big task, but how can I do something about this? I'm um, just, I would say inform people. If you have listservs or blogs, um, things like that, just start spreading the word a little bit at a time. It doesn't have to be you know, the full research and dissertation. And congratulations, by the way. Um, you know, what we need are more midwives, more people who are concerned, who can do the, the, hum, the humanity, add the humanity back to um, these birthing process. This is ritual, this is life, you know? And so we need to have people who have the type of mindset to deal with folks when they're at their most vulnerable, but also at their most brilliant. Um, I would say if you can do a short blog, maybe once a, a, a week, if that, where you're just putting little notes about, about Sims. Or, you know, I would say a lot of times when scholars do books, they do books for other scholars. When I do books, I do books for people out in the, in the community to read because I need you to understand what we're talking about um, in academia. So um, the goal would be for you as now a new scholar, a new leader here, um, to just do something short, a couple of paragraphs with photos or some of the things that you found um, in your own practice that you feel need to be added to um, the information that people have. And you could just even tweet it or Facebook it yep. or just like get it out there. Um, mm -hmm. Jake says, amazing talk, she could listen to you all day. Kaina M says, thank you so much for this lecture, Dr. Sherman. I'm currently writing a paper on how Jordan Peele, director Get Out, drew off the history of eugenics to inform the idea of violence against black bodies and expression of black consciousness in, consciousness in this film, Get Out. Your lecture and references will be a huge resource for me, exclamation mark. Thank you, thank you. And I look forward to that. I think Jordan Peele, there are a lot of people in Hollywood that understand eugenics and they tend to slide the information in sometimes where if you watch the film Get Out or you watch Django Unchained, you understand that there's certain things there that disturbed you or it made something in you sit up and take notice, but you can't quite figure it out. And that's part of my job to make sure that, that you can deconstruct it um, and, and, and reckon with it. Okay, Patricia says, thank you for clarifying this topic about the pandemic. I say the same, I'm often shouted down, exclamation mark. <laughs> yeah. um, and Mr. Cousy, Ms. Cousy says, not to mention that while black people in the US, UK are purportedly more susceptible to COVID-19, Africa as a whole has been the least affected of all continents. Well, and then even if you say, you know, when I, susceptibility is about proximity. So if you're in um, an apartment building, um, you're in a bunch of flats. I have to remember where I am. Yeah, if you're in a bunch of flats and you're using a common elevator or a common stairwell, it's different than being in a house somewhere where you got a front yard and a backyard. So you're not coming in contact with other people. Um, if you have to go to work, you're not a, a first responder as in you're a, a nurse or a paramedic, but you work in a grocery store and you're required to be there. It means that the level of susceptibility is greater. And so that's not a race trait. That's a class trait or that's a social trait. And so, you know, that's what I said. Don't even add race to the conversation. And the, as soon as people add race to the conversation, then I immediately stop listening because you've already determined that it's that bad black body, once again, rather than looking at all of the other possibilities, um, the very tangible and real possibilities, riding public transportation. Um, that's your susceptibility, closed in spaces. You know, so um, we just have to be smarter about challenging that. And so every time a news article comes up, if you wanna respond, okay, what about the fact that everyone's living on top of each other or riding tra public transportation or, working as the people who have, you know, they're bagging your groceries while you're at the store picking up the stuff you need. Those are the things, just 
keep pelting people with these little notions so that they understand this is the reality of it and it has nothing to do with race. Um, someone mentioned, um, well, how, what was the spelling for the product that caused the soldiers to lose erections? And I remember something about my um, investigation of World War II because two things in World War II, um, soldiers were sometimes given something called bromide, B-R-O-M-I-D-E, B -R -O -M -I -D -E, which is supposed to reduce their sex drive. But also speaking of soldiers, when it came to black soldiers in any kind of war you had, whether they had white generals, um, the black soldiers were often sent in the front line to do the most dangerous and tough missions. And that happened in Vietnam, the Civil War, happened in World War II, happened in many situations. And the comparison here is that one explanation for the death rate of black people when it comes to COVID, coronavirus, et cetera, is that you might be the situation that in certain hospitals, they'll send the black staff to do all the most dangerous jobs and that kind of thing. I don't know if you've heard about that, Dr. Santana. Yes, yeah. I mean, and, and it's all of the above. Um, quite frankly, you know, we talk about, again, the doctors, the nurses who may have been given um, the shields and protection, the gloves, the masks, the necessary things that they're supposed to have. But the cleanup crew, the people that are coming behind to clean are just told, you know, put some gloves, the, the same gloves that they would normally use, but they have no masks on. So it, it's like <laughs> you've, you've made a class distinction, but guess what? The doctors and nurses can't do what they do without contagion, without the cleaners, um, and without the people that prep, and without the people who strike down, um, and about the, with the people that move the the the, the uh, folks through the wards and things like that. So, um, yeah, that that's never really taken into consideration. As far as soft Peter is spelled um, over here exactly the way it's it's you know it's S O F T first word Peter P E T E R. Um, and it's my understanding it's given in um, prisons as well as the military. Um, and they don't, they don't give an actual um, chemical breakdown. I've heard some people say bromine. I've heard um, others say that um, in prison that they were given it as a, a green drink um, in the medical ward rather than inside their food. So I have no idea exactly what the, the um, breakdown of that is. Yeah, Fiona says, overwhelming talk. Thank you, very informative, very engaging from Fiona. Um, Dr. Sherman, when, when do you, will, will you be back in the country, in this country next year, do you think? You're going to have another trip scheduled? <laughs> I pray I will. You know, this is, I try and do uh, both October and May um, of every year there. And so I would have actually arrived <laughs> um, in London on the 29th. I would have arrived uh, Friday. Um, this trip, but you know, because of COVID, um, yes, I'm, I, I try and make it a twice a year event. Um, and um, just for the record, I do um, some work. I'm doing some research um, with ITV for Coronation Street specifically, looking at eugenic themes in um, their programming. And so that's why you have that cover with uh, Carla and Peter up there um, in the midst of all the black stuff. Um, you know, sometimes representations of race show up in white characters. And I started to see it quite a bit in Coronation Street. So, um, yeah, I, I tend to try and go back to run up to Manchester and check in on what it is that they're filming in addition to making sure that I hit you guys at Black History Walks. All right, um, Liz Hughes mentioned about um, vaccines, and that links, in, of course, to um, how big pharmaceutical companies will sometimes or often test drugs in either black areas in America, or they'll go to Africa and test drugs there. Um, can you say anything about that, Dr. Sherman? Um, that's, it's very common. And also, um, we had a number of instances here in America that few people want to talk or wants to, they want to talk about it, they don't want to remember it. Um, but there was a situation in areas like Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, um, where the military, through you know medical establishments, decided that they wanted to spray um, these neighborhoods to determine um, if black people, what the reaction would be to certain types of chemicals. Um, so say it's something that they're going to use in um, farming or agriculture, um, and they want to determine if, you know, if the people in the farm workers or the planters, if it'll hurt their families. Um, they've been known to spray this stuff over black neighborhoods and black communities. Um, and then just kind of because all of these black people are tied to um, the, the community, they go to the community health clinic, they have community health providers, um, they deal with social workers. 
it means that their health is in the hands of other people. So if I come to you and say, oh, I have a rash, you can look at that rash and know, oh, that's a direct reaction to whatever chemical was placed um, in their atmosphere or in their water. Um, and you know this, but you know then not to treat me for whatever it is that I think it is. You'll tell, you'll give me some type of placebo. You'll give me something that's basically a sugar pill um, to just kind of chart what it is that's going on with that. Um, and to that point, um, and I'm glad that you brought that up, I usually leave this up as my, my last screen. Um, when we start talking about bodies under investigation and examination, exploitation, um, my aunt, this is my aunt, um, Henrietta Ross Murray. Um, she passed away at 83, 84 years old, had a lovely life. Um, she was one of 13 children. My mother is the youngest. But as a, as a preteen, as a nine-year-old, she and one of her brothers, who was 11, they were taken from the school um, and taken to another city, another town, and they were given uh, syphilis shots, all right? And what we found out later was that um, in the same way that Alabama, Tuskegee had the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, there were five states that had syphilis serological experimentations going on at the same time. Alabama was only one. Mississippi, where my aunt, my family's from, um, they also had syphilis experiments going on there. The Mississippi experiments wanted to determine if you gave syphilis, injected syphilis into the system of prepubescent children, they had not gone through puberty yet, would it keep them from reproducing? Would it keep them from having children? And so my aunt and one of my uncles at nine and 11 years old, they were subjected to two weeks of being injected with syphilis shots. As an adult woman, please understand and thank God for it, she was not um, she left town eventually, but it didn't do what it was expected to do. All right. Just thank God for that. Um, she went on to have seven children, um, wonderful kids, grandkids, all of that was fine. Um, her brother eventually went into the military. And at that point he receives either some type of um, antibiotic or something else that basically negated the syphilis in his stream. Neither of them ever had any type of syphilitic outbreaks in the way that um, gynecology or obstetrics would note it, but until the day she passed away, syphilis was in her bloodstream, all right? And so that became important just as she got older. Um, they wanted to check and figure out whether or not she was going to have, um, you know, go crazy or um, have heart issues based upon um, the syphilis experiment or the syphilis that's untreated in other people. But because she ended up getting those injections, like I said, as a nine-year-old, um, by the time she was in her 80s, it was just old age that was basically, you know, she was on a decline. And when she passed at 83, 84 years old, we are taking her to the doctor. And it was always a, a question of, do your relatives know, can we speak freely about your blood? Because there's still, there was syphilis in her blood until she died. It did not transmit to her children and all of her children was fine, were fine. But this is what I'm talking about when we say there are blanket experimentations sometimes that are going on in families and no one talks about it. No one says anything. And so um, we have to get to a point where we open up that dialogue. All right, we've got about five minutes left, Dr. Sherman. So is there anything you want to say in closing and people in the um, chat room, people want to say if you've got about five minutes to say, say it before you kind of log off. Um, but yeah, Dr. Sherman, anything you want to say in general about your work or next week or other things in general? Um, just please um, keep reading. I always use the terms, you know, onward, upward, always. Um, when, I don't know who the person was that said, you know, our, our power sometimes is between the pages of books. We have to get back to a point where we're, we're doing research. And I thank you all for actually, you know, being a part of, of um, Black History Walks because it's showing that you have a mind to keep learning. Um, and then what you learn, please disseminate that information, have conversations with your, with your friends and your peers, and most importantly, with your children. Um, yeah, and thanks to Jamie Kier for putting some reference or research up in the um, chat room there. The talk next week is actually all of our events are on the website. So if you go to blackhistorywalks.co.uk, so it's blackhistorywalks.co.uk, you'll see a list of all event, uh, events there. And next week's talk is titled Population Control Video TV. So it's called Population Control Video Television. And, um, but it's all on the website, which is just blackhistorywalks.co.uk. So, Thank you very much, Dr. Sherman. We'll be seeing you next week. And thank you for the people in the room. And that's it. See you later. All right. Thank you, guys. Be blessed.